This morning I'm here with the uh, JCC with Morton Bobby Klein on behalf of the Jewish Historical Society of Fairfield County. Uh, my name is Lester Sharlak and we're going to do an interview on the life of the Kleins. Very good. Okay. Did you know it was Tuesday, April 5th? Yeah, I know. That's a lucky day that I was able to see Morton Bobby. <laughs> uh, tell me, uh, what is your full birth name? Morton Kenneth Klein. And what do you like people to call you? Morty is the usual greeting. Okay. And where were you born? I was born in Stanford in Stanford Hospital. And do you remember who your doctor was? It was uh, one of the Nemortons. Well, it must have been Jacob. <laughs> and uh, did your parents, were they born in the United States or did they come from New York? I, I believe my father was born in New York. Well, my mother came here from Minsk, Russia, mm -hmm. from Belarus. And did she come here as a, a youngster or was she an older? She tells me, she told me the story how she was so young that she looked through the bars of the ship, through the railings from underneath, and she, she saw the Statue of Liberty that way. That mm -hmm. was her first sight. And about what year do you think that might have oh, been? Oh my God. I'm not sure. I don't remember. I have it written down at home, uh -huh. but it's hard to remember. Yeah. But they didn't come to Ellis Island. They went to somewhere in Brooklyn. And uh, where did your parents meet each other? They met at uh, at a camp in Moodus, Connecticut. Oh. I don't know the name of the camp, but uh, yeah, they had both happened to be there that summer. I think that the uh, Rothschilds had uh, settled uh, Jewish farmers in that area. Oh, is that right? Yeah, and there were chicken farms there. Yeah. That, uh, that's probably what... You saw area. that show on Broadway. Yeah. I don't remember that. Uh, so, the uh, parents... When did your parents get married? Twenty-eight or twenty-nine. Mm-hmm. And what did the, your the parents, uh, your dad, what did he do for a living then? My father was Jacob Klein, he was called Jack, mm -hmm. and he had many um, jobs before he was married. After they got married, my mother always pushed him to be in a business, be his own boss. And so he bought a newspaper route. At the time, Kingsley Gillespie was still running the Advocate, and um, he knew him very well. Uh, and he bought this uh, newspaper route that covered the entire east side of Stanford, with the exception of Chapin, which was someone else, I think, Sam Chase. Mm -hmm. And he developed um, a huge route, an amazingly huge route, because later on in the 40s, I guess, uh, Fowler and Hartman developed Fairlawn and that was in his section. Mm -hmm. That was a huge development, and it still is a huge development. And so he delivered newspapers. They had about five or six station wagons, most of them without doors, which is an interesting story. I'll tell you later if you'd like. I can tell you now how a dog jumped into the back of the car and became our dog because he would never want to leave that car. He had a collar around his neck with the phone number of the people who were the real owners mm -hmm. and we called them and said, we have your dog in our living room and he won't get out but he won't walk on a rug, he walks around the rug. She said he's trained not to go on the rug but if you, do you have a car or a truck that he jumped in? We said, yes, we have cars that have no doors in the back so that the boys or young men can jump in and out of the car and deliver newspapers. Well, he said, that dog is yours. 
<laughs> I remember. He'll never leave you because you have yeah. no doors and he loves to ride in your car. Do you remember my dog? I, re I dog? don't remember your dogs, but I do very clearly remember the uh, Ford station wagon with mm -hmm. the wood sides and without a tailgate and without doors. Right. The old because, woodies. Uh, I was friendly with your brother. Jerry, right, and uh, occasionally we would ride and help deliver newspapers when the carrier didn't show up. Right. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and your mom was a homemaker. So my mother was basically a homemaker until she was needed for any emergency that a driver was out sick or the, the papers sometimes were so big. Don't forget, there are papers that don't exist anymore. The Herald Tribune and the Sun Times and the Italian paper, the Jewish paper, the Spanish paper, the Greek paper. So there were so many papers that they, on Sunday they couldn't fit into a bicycle basket. So we put the papers in the cars and then my mother would drive on a Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. My father worked 365 days a year and never took a day off except four. I think one time he got sick, I had like 104, 103 something, and he was in bed one day and my mother took him to double routes. Mm -hmm. And uh, Very labor intensive. How many years did he remain oh, in that business? God, it was from World War II almost the beginning until um, just around when Bobby and I got married in 58 mm -hmm. or 56 maybe a year yeah. or so beforehand, at which time they opened up a bridal gown store in New York City and commuted every day. First my mother was there and then my father gave his brother, Irving Klein, the route and then he went to that store. He ran the store. Was the store in Manhattan? The store was on 5 West 14th Street. Mm -hmm. And 14th Street was a big bridal gown section in New York at that time. Um, and it was, uh, again, a labor intensive where you had to be there every day except Sundays. So it was great for my parents because they got to work regular hours and my father didn't have to get up at four in the morning and deliver papers in the rain, snow. Was it an established business that they bought? or No, it, it was. It was Madame Campanella and it became Madame Lillian's, which is my mother's first name. So, um, we all had a good time in the store. Mm -hmm. My brother Jerry Klein and myself. And father and mother. We all worked in the store at one time or another. Uh, so uh, they remained in that business till they retired? Is it, yes. Uh, they didn't retire gracefully. They were, the lease was up and that area became developed, gentrified and mm -hmm. developed. And um, so they really just went out of business. And where did you live in Stanford at that time? Well, I was born on Frederick Street in an upstairs apartment and they called it the big house. It was not prison, but it was a, uh, a huge apartment house on the corner of Frederick Street and I um, can't think of the name of the, other, the main street from Japan. And that was the area we grew up in and played. And then when my father bought the business, the newspaper business, we had to move to a house where we could fold the papers in a garage. Mm -hmm. You know, the Times has how many sections? Yeah. Maybe a dozen sections. So we'd have to slide all those sections into the Times. And we needed a place to keep all the Saturday papers that would be delivered on Sunday. We would get delivery from the New York Times on Saturday and then they had to be folded and put together and then the final couple of pages, the front pages, would be delivered Sunday morning, three in the morning, and then we'd fit those in. So where was, where did that you That was on to? Park Street. It was 13 Park Street till the city changed it to 39 Park Street. Mm -hmm. And we lived there with our dog Butch and 
It was a nice house. I think it cost my parents $3,200 or $3,800 for a three-bedroom house with a parlor and a cellar, living room, dining room, kitchen, two, two, two and a half baths. Magnificent. $3,800. So that, that was in third, that was around 40, mm -hmm. 1940, that they bought that house. And when you were uh, growing up, uh, did you find where your parents have any time to belong to any political organizations? Were they involved? In My father wasn't involved in politics, but he certainly belonged to the uh, Agud Shalom. Mm -hmm. And um, my mother had a kosher upbringing, and she she also went to shul when there wasn't work to be done or newspapers to be delivered. Um, and he so he didn't belong and do political work like Bobby and I have done over the years, but he was a member of the uh, Pythias group. Knights of Pythias. Knights of Pythias. Yes. You remember those, so. yeah. And uh, he wasn't a big joiner because he was always working when mm -hmm. things were happening. Mm -hmm. And he was the kind of guy in business. If you called up at seven o'clock while we were eating dinner, and you said I didn't get my advocate, he would say, "Okay, I'll bring it as soon as I swallow this food. I'll run out and deliver the newspaper to you." And he'd pick up an advocate or two and actually go out seven or eight o'clock at night mm -hmm. and deliver that paper. So when you moved to Park Street, what schools did you go to? Those were fun years when I think back. Um, we went to Roger School, and Roger School was, I think, the only school in Stanford that had K through nine. Mm -hmm. So we stayed for 10 years in the same school. I'm glad I didn't stay back. <laughs> 10 years is a long time, but we made some great friends, and uh, we have very fond memories of those years. My dog would walk me to school and then greet me when I came home. And we had that garage in back, of course, which my father fixed up so we could fold the papers in comfort, so it was like a, a den in the mm -hmm. garage. It was wonderful. So we had a chicken coop in the back, in the back of the garage. My father loved to raise, he liked to be farm things and work with his hands in the yard. And as Bobby will tell you, I had to cut the lawn every week on yes. Saturday and cut the hedges every week. <laughs> and she would drive over to see me and I'd be cutting hedges and I had to be straight and lined up and all that. Yeah. So the neighborhood always looked nice. It wasn't a wealthy neighborhood, but it was middle, real yeah. strong, middle class Stanford. Do you remember going to William Street School? Yeah, well that was Rogers Street School. <laughs> But it was. As a matter of fact, I remember um, I was a goody-goody in school. I didn't do anything wrong. So they made me the bell ringer. And at that time, we had a bell that you actually rang like this. And I whacked myself in my tooth and broke the front tooth. My mother was devastated. And how could you do that, she said. I said, well, ring the bell. It's an honor to ring the bell. And uh, the dentist said, as soon as uh, you get older, we'll have it fixed for you. They didn't have good materials in those days, yeah. but uh, later on it was taken care of. Was there any particular teacher who was memorable? Who might oh have been boy, your... they were all very, very, very memorable. Old-fashioned teacher who uh, cared about you as a person. Mm -hmm. One of the strongest memories I have is of Gilbert Gledhill who was the music teacher on a steady basis. But we also had Miss Graff who came around with her little pitch pipe mm -hmm. and would <laughs> get everybody to sing on tune. And, she, Ooh, and you'd have to pick up the note. And so she taught us lots of stuff too. But music was a very big influence in my life. And this guy, Gilbert Gledhill, who was a wonderful piano player and he conducted us. And we had music at least once a week in those days. Mm -hmm. We went to music, it was like English or math or any other yeah. thing. We learned all these songs that kids today never hear about. But um, he introduced me to Gilbert and Sullivan and I became a big Gilbert and Sullivan fan. 
And then he took us to the opera, and that changed my whole life. Mm -hmm. I never sang opera, except in the shower. But uh, I learned to love classical music in those days, especially in high school. The rock and roll was just coming in, and I would listen to rock and roll, which I loved, and to the classical music, the symphonies and all the operas, and it changed my whole life. Uh, you mentioned that your mother uh, was more orthodox. Did, right. you, did you keep a kosher home? We kept a kosher home until... <laughs> We're laughing because I was very skinny as a child. I don't know if you remember, but Jerry's little brother was a skinny runt, and I was really, really thin. And so and when I went to the William Street School as part of Rogers School, I weighed like 60 pounds in the fifth grade or something like crazy. So she took me to a doctor who said, you want to fatten up this guy? You got to give him bacon and pork chops and all that stuff. And so that was the end of the Kashrath part of my life. And it was, uh, it was not sad because the food is delicious, but we never really ate pork in the house. We, I had bacon, but nobody else really partook of that stuff. It's funny because I was the most religious educated person in the house. So my brother didn't like Hebrew school at all, but I loved it all. I loved the uh, Jewish Center, going there and playing. I worked there for a time in the basket room. And I loved all the classes. I loved the teachers and the rabbi. It was a strong part of my life then. The, in Hebrew school? In Hebrew school, right? Do you remember? We walked from Japan to Rogers School, and then Rogers School up Crystal Street to the Jewish Center yeah. on Strawberry Hill. Do you remember who your teachers were in Hebrew School? Well, it was, uh, do you remember Rabbi Tacher? Yeah. Yeah, so he was one of them. And then Mr. and Mrs. Schiffman were great teachers of mine. Yeah. And it's funny, I remember my brother, uh, someone named Weinstein. Yeah. But I was too young oh, to yeah. really think. But I think he had a leather hand. Do you remember that? Yeah, and he married one of the other Hebrew school teachers. It was very pretty. Pretty right? girl, yeah. pretty lady. I remember her more than I remember him. Yeah, right. I know he had a leather hand that yeah. to sort yeah, of hide. He was in a, in an got in a machine or something. an industrial something. accident. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And That's Mr. Totus was the principal. Totus was the principal, right. You must have been in the same school I was in. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, so obviously you were bar mitzvah. I was bar mitzvah, and then we stayed in school, Hebrew school, for one or two years after I became a bar mitzvah, and so um, it's unusual because kids today seem to they can't wait to get out, mm -hmm. and so they started a different uh, kind of a sort of high school, but it's more of a social thing that the kids mm -hmm. go for. So uh, but I remember going to Hebrew school was, and walking back, and I remember when Israel was made a state, and when World War II was over, we rem I remember all that stuff how we celebrated, and of course we all suffered when Roosevelt died. <laughs> Getting back to your bar mitzvah, oh boy, what was the celebration like? Well, mine was a little unusual because. We had the dinner at my house, and we got rid of all the chickens that we had in the chicken coop. It's funny, I don't know if you know this, but if you take a chicken and put it on, my father had a wooden stump in the yard, and take and hold it and chop their head off, they get up and they run around the yard. It's like a chicken without its head. <laughs> and. Uh, so we cooked up a whole bunch of chickens, and that's what we had for my dinner party. Mm -hmm. At, uh, my brother, on the other hand, had Miss Ma Falk do his bar mitzvah. Were you there? No. <laughs> we were the same age, but they didn't invite all the kids to the bar mitzvah no. parties. No, no, they didn't. It was just for the adults. And but the I parents. remember going to Mrs. Falk's house or place, wherever yeah. the party was, and standing on a ladder and giving a speech to my brother. You know, welcoming him, thanking my older brother, my hero, and um, 
He was a rough hero. <laughs> but he, we were five years difference, so he was much older than that. Yeah. But you were close. We were very close because that's the way it was in those days when you had family members. Everyone depended on the other person mm -hmm. to help and kick in, especially in a working family like we were. But I had a bicycle route that delivered the Advocate, and my brother uh, had one, and then he drove. He became a driver to mm -hmm. give my mother relief on Sunday mornings or um, any day during the week that there was a problem. I remember having a bicycle with a basket that was so huge, I don't know how I drove it. Mm -hmm. It's like I said, I weighed nothing in those days. I made up for it. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> um, those were good old days as mm -hmm. I think of them now. There were some problems, of course, and everybody was concerned about listening to the speeches on the radio about the war. But um, because of all the closeness of the family and the religious part of my life and the music part of my life, those are the things that I remember. And of course the dog was a big part of it. But, uh, and my parents put up with all our silliness and all the things that we did and having a dog in the house. The dog used to smile, you know. If you said, smile, but she got <laughs> like that. <laughs> Right, Bobby? Yeah. <laughs> How did your parents decide to come to Stanford in the first place? That's interesting. We, I'm not sure. Um, I think at the time was the, um, the end of the Depression. And he was, my father didn't have a profession, but uh, came to work because there was work in Stanford and there was a Jewish community and they settled in Stanford. I don't know. They didn't talk a lot about their past life. Yeah. I know my mother talked about being in Russia and she says she remembers the pogroms, but I don't know if a three-year-old can remember that kind of stuff. But vivid, certainly vivid acts of horse people riding through the streets with sabers and all that. Yeah. She said she remembered it. Tell me, uh, when you were graduated from Roger School, Mm. You went to Stanford High because that was the only high school in Stanford. That's right. And how was your experiences in, in the Stanford High School? It was great. I, I got pretty good marks, but the biggest thing that happened was that I met my wife at Stanford High School. And uh, actually it's because of the Jewish Center that we met, because we were both counselors. And that's where we met for the second time. Mm -hmm. Why do I say the second time that we met? Because I was at her one-year-old birthday party. <laughs> 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 Our parents were good friends for a while, short while. And I went to her one-year-old party and I bought her a pair of pajamas. Mm -hmm. I remember buying them. I was <laughs> two. She was one. And, um, and then... Fourteen years later, I met her again at summer camp. We were both counselors, and she fell in love. She fell in love instantly. <laughs> I took a little longer. This was Camp JC. Camp JC. Yeah. I think there's a picture outside on the wall, yeah. maybe that might have us in there. We'll JC, it. the acronym for Jewish Center. Right. Uh, while you were in high school, did you uh, find any anti-Semitism? Actually, the, it was more anti-Semitic at Rogers School. And it's, mm -hmm. it wasn't the school. It was a few guys who lived, not with the guys that I played with after school, on Park Street, Frederick Street, but they lived like three or four blocks away, mm -hmm. up more towards Japan Avenue. And, uh, one of them, maybe two, gave me a rough time walking to school every day. Mm -hmm. So um, I came home one day very upset, and my brother Jerry said, what's the matter? Or my mother said, what's wrong? I said, oh, they're calling me dirty Jew. <laughs> <laughs> so I think my mother told my brother to go see who it was. So, I think we, he drove 
So he, if he was 16 and I was 11, something like that, he drove. I said, there they are, there's those two guys. I don't want to, want to name them, but I know them very well today and I could squash them both right now. Because <laughs> um, they're smaller than I am and not as strong. And he picked them both up like this and shook them and said, leave my brother alone. That was it. That was it. it never bothered me. Yeah. I get teary easy. Yeah. So you graduated Stanford High, and then what was Graduated Stanford High, went to UConn. Mm -hmm. And uh, in those days, if you were in the top 30 of your class, you didn't take any tests. We have no regions, and when I took no college board exams or anything like that. We just walked into school. That's the way it was. Um, and then... Um, UConn was a fun time, and then after that, I was offered some jobs. What what what, what, what did you get your degree in? What what was your? I'll be a regular be mm -hmm. and I was a government history major because I love history and um, government. I loved all that stuff, uh, and I was offered a, a terrific job when I came out, but the Army was looming. I was in ROTC and I became a lieutenant after summer camp and went through all of that, and which I was good at all that stuff, but the Army is the Army and uh, well, for some reason my brother and I never liked any part of that stuff. I don't know whether it was the fact that we weren't our own bosses or or we just didn't like to take orders from people or with me I think it was the hurry up and wait thing that if you had to be at a certain place with your platoon at 7 in the morning they would get you there at 5.30 and then you, you wait to make sure that you're on time mm -hmm. I couldn't stand that I couldn't stand the inactivity and things like that but that was a happy time for me because it was there was no war on when I was in the army after Yukon I went in, and that was uh, the six-month program, because there was no war at that time. There was nothing. As a matter of fact, I went all through that and then served six months in the reserves, and I am not a veteran. I don't qualify for any veteran. Mm -hmm. I can't get pills or hearing aids <laughs> or any of that stuff, because, like I said, there was Korea and there was mm -hmm. Vietnam, which we were prepared for. and. Um, I was in a unit that was called STRAC, Strategic Ready Around the Clock. And we had two bags full of gear. One was for use here, and one was you leave under your bed, or in the bachelor's officer quarter, it would be in a closet. Mm -hmm. And that one was not to be touched until we were called up. And I said, well, where would, where were we, where would we go? And they said, probably Berlin. That was the Berlin airlift time. Mm -hmm. So I said, great, I always wanted to go see Germany. And he said, well, you're not going to get much look at Germany because we're not going to be allowed in there. We're going to be flown in and then do our business and then leave. But I was in the infantry and I was a marksman and I was the platoon leader. I think it had 60 seconds life expectancy as a platoon leader in yeah. those days. But, um, so that my army career was uh, not short, but like I said, there was no war. We never saw any real action. You said it was six months. I was in the regular army for six months, uh -huh. but I was in the reserves for five and a half years. And when you were and in the reserves? We went reserve? to meetings and we went to summer camps and we mm -hmm. did s stuff like that. So now you're back in the community. <laughs> I love being in Stanford. We love Stanford. We think, thought about moving to different places and we'll talk about it, but I know Stanford is my home and Bobby's home. We have so much ties, so many ties and so much love for the community that we really wanted to stay here. And so we never left. We are in the same house that uh, we were able to buy for $29,000, an uh, acre and a quarter in Stanford, and never moved from that house. We moved from an apartment in Hoyt Bedford, and um, just couldn't get an apartment in those days. 
you had to, had to be very, very nice to the people who gave you the apartment, the superintendents, and you just couldn't get an apartment. You had to wait. So we moved in with Bobby's parents in a beautiful house, uh, and I guess uh, less than a year later we got an apartment in Hoyt and Bedford Street. It was new and it was beautiful with plenty of closet space, which my wife loves. And so we stayed there and then we broke the lease, but we didn't really break it because we got somebody to take our apartment, mm -hmm. which was easy because there were no apartments to be had. And we bought this house, it was $29,990. Mm -hmm. And uh, where is your house? We live on Slice Drive in Stanford, which is in Springdale. And it's really a lovely house. It's not big. It was 20 by 40 on two levels, so it was 1,600 square feet. And then for my 50th birthday, my wife added uh, a den in the back of the house that's half the size of the house. So that's where we live, and it's right next to the kitchen. So it's very easy for me to go out and grab some food. And so we watch television and live in that den. Mm -hmm. And that's, we love it. We have a beautiful yard for the many animals that we had, the different, different kinds of animals. My wife is an animal lover as I am. Mm -hmm. So we had cats and dogs and hamsters and gerbils and um, we love it. We still love it. We haven't moved till today. Mm -hmm. Married 57 years and I guess the house was from 60 or 61. And so, from 61, let's say, until now, we've been in the same house. Mm -hmm. Many additions, many, you know, fixing ups along the way. But I love it. It's the best thing in our mm -hmm. lives. So, backing up a little bit, where was your wedding ceremony? Well, we got married in Greenwich at Temple Shalom. Mm -hmm. And we had the catering there also. Um, Rabbi Aaron Krantz married us, and he knew my brother very well, and we knew him and his wife, and we knew him because he was part of my... He was not the rabbi who bar mitzvahed me, that was Tyker, but he uh, came to Stanford, I think, the year after that. So uh, we knew him for many, many years, and he knew our family, mm -hmm. and he knew Bobby's family. And as a matter of fact, I'm actually married to Debbie, Bobby's sister, because during the ceremony when he said, I now pronounce you and Debbie man and wife. <laughs> okay. So what does that mean? You have it on tape? Um, uh, <laughs> we don't, we never, we, he wouldn't allow you to videotape mm -hmm. anything. I don't even know, there were video cameras, but there were cameras, there were 16 millimeter cameras. But that's the fact. I can swear to it, and not too many people left from that wedding, mm -hmm. except some friends of ours. But uh, most of the family's gone. So, so you're married. You're living on a nice drive. How many children? I don't know who I'm married to, uh, but <laughs> I live with her, and we have two beautiful children, two beautiful boys, who are really, really great, and they're happily married. Uh, my eldest son, Eric Klein, is a dentist in Norwalk, and my younger son, Gary Klein, is a lawyer in Stanford, and he was on the Board of Ed in Stanford, and constantly in the paper, and writing letters to the editor, and he's a very prolific uh, writer, and uh, they're both very capable, they're both very happy, they each have two children. What more could you ask? So we're very happy with that, and our extended family is wonderful, very nice. When you moved to uh, Slice Drive, you're, uh, where, where are you working? How did you make a living? Oh, that's an interesting story. <laughs> My wife's family had, um, her grandfather had a butcher store and a grocery store, and then during the war you couldn't get beef unless you were a certain rank in the business, of meat business. So he became a wholesale meat guy. 
in order to get more meat to sell because it was easy to sell beef during the war. So instead of buying, only getting to buy one animal, you could buy maybe 10 animals. So he was able to do that. And then that expanded. And they needed more people, so they asked me if I would join uh, the business. And by that time, they had a beautiful warehouse at uh, 271 Canal Street in Stanford, of course, which is gone now because of the um, many buildings and the um, urban renewal that took place down there and replaced all of that with high-rise buildings of uh, commercial value. And that's where I worked for a long time until 1976 when I opened my own business with the Berman, Dave Berman, who, and we became partners and opened up just a restaurant supply. The company that I worked for with Bobby's family what was, the name was called of? Stanford Dressed Beef Company, mm -hmm. which he took from a company in Brooklyn that was called United Dressed Beef. Mm -hmm. Dressed Beef being after the animal is killed, the skin is taken off and the animal is dressed with uh, cloth that keeps the fat and everything together and nice, pretty looking. Nicer looking than mm -hmm. it looks after it's slaughtered. So... Um, what was the grandfather's name? Isaac Goldberg. Mm -hmm. I Goldberg was his name. And he had uh, asked his son-in-law, Sam Shavelson, who was Bobby's father, to come into the business. And then they in turn asked Dave Berman and myself to come in. So we had some depth of ownership mm -hmm. there. But the wholesale part of that business was drying up because as with the advent of World War II brought on the growth of chain stores, A&P, Grand Union, First National, and those took over in the communities and people went there because they had one-step shopping. You could buy meats and groceries and fish. So a lot of the butchers in Stanford, there used to be one in every neighborhood, Italian butcher, Polish butcher, Jewish, three Jewish butchers in Stanford at one time. Now there are none. Um, so I saw the growth of restaurants coming. And I said, to Dave, if you want to come with me, I'm going to open up my own restaurant supply business. And so we opened up Berman and Klein Food Service Company, which meant the emphasis was not just on beef or lamb or veal, it was on food. Whatever you could buy to eat and feed people, that's what we sold. We filled their needs. And so we became pretty popular. We were doing a heck of a nice business. And um, herb, uh, let's see, Urban Renewal came and the wholesale business moved down the street, down the end of Canal Street. And that's when we left and we opened up on Dock Street. And uh, we had a nice business there till we decided to sell. Found somebody that wanted it. A younger family, mm -hmm. and you have to be a family to own, run that kind of business because it's so labor intensive. I mean, we I used to unload cattle four quarters that weighed two hundred pounds, high quarter hind quarters that weighed one hundred and seventy pounds, and you carry those out by hand. It was never ever, um, nothing was ever invented that would carry that meat from the truck to your place of business. You had to unhook it from the truck and carry it out and hook it on your own rails and then move it in. Then the rails took over so you didn't have to schlep it all over the place. Um, but there has never been an invention that would take care of that for you. So what happened is they stopped bringing meat like that to the East Coast and instead they cut it up out West. And took bones away and fat away and sent it in boxes. And that was the end of the butcher shops because they didn't want the boxes. The beauty of a butcher shop is if you came into the store and you said, I'd like a porterhouse steak, they'd go in the back and they'd take this big piece of meat and cut you a porterhouse steak. 
and you could tell them how thin you want it or how thick you want it, but you can't do that today anymore. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows anything about that part of the business. Today everything comes in pre-packaged for them. All right, when you uh, finish the uh, active part of the income-producing career in the food business, what was your next step? Well, the kids, um, kids were through with college, and I sold my business, and Dave, we both sold our business, to someone who was in the grocery business and put the two together, and that was a good idea. And then I went to work for the city of Stamford. I had been involved with many people in the government. And so I took a civil service test. I studied very hard and very long for a civil service job. And I got picked. I was one of uh, 20 people that took that test. And I came in t number two. And I was picked to be in the city of Stanford, to work for the city of Stanford as an assistant to the manager of the solid waste department. So I went from one end of the food business to the other end of the food business. Explain making, to us what solid waste is. <laughs> I think you probably know what solid waste is. <laughs> It's uh, the end result of all the food that you eat that you buy from me and then I had to take it back at the, when I worked for the city. But it's what goes down the bathroom toilet. Yeah. And that and um, picking up garbage is a, is a non-glorious job, a very, very important. And so I was assigned as an assistant and then his name was Lou David, was the manager. He ran that whole department. And then uh, after a few years, I think two years, he decided to retire and he passed away a year after that. But I took over that department. We had about 90 people working for us. It included garbage collection, recycling, and um, Planning. I had also been on the planning board for the city for about five years before that as a volunteer. And that's how I became to know a lot about the city. Um, as soon as I got out of the business, I had time to do all these things. Because in that meat business was a 12-hour day at least, every day. Um, and then we worked half a day on Saturday from 6 in the morning until 2 in the afternoon. That's a half a day in that business. So did you get involved with politics now that you And that's when I got involved in politics, and um, which I didn't really love, but I liked the people who worked there. Mm -hmm. And so um, my wife and I became very involved. As a matter of fact, I became a justice of the peace, and I married a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. And I had a guarantee on my marriages, and they all worked. Um. Except for one couple that uh, couldn't couldn't make it. Mm -hmm. So how were you involved in the politicals? I worked for the city? Democratic Party, and mm -hmm. I became vice president of the Democratic City Committee. Uh, we were good friends with Ellen Kim, I, who was the president of the Democratic Party. Uh, it was a lot of work, a lot of paperwork, and a lot of phone calling, and getting out the vote kind of thing. Very important. But we were both, Barbie and I were both part of that work gang. So are you still involved with the party? I'm not really as involved as I used to be. So what are you doing now in your spare time? Well, I belong to the Senior Men's Association of Stanford. And for a while I uh, helped a fellow who had uh, needed dialysis. And I drove for him and picked him up and did some of his shopping and helped him out. He was a 84-year-old uh, policeman, ex-cop from Brooklyn. He's yeah. a tough guy and told me many stories. And he had a security business. I would drive him to Queens one day and then yeah. the rest of the time would be in Stanford. Mm -hmm. But that was an interesting part. And then he passed away. Um, 
and uh, now it's mostly meetings. I belonged to the choir for a while. I sang in that, and then my uh, voice just disappeared. So I stopped doing that, but um, mostly it's that, and I read books now more than I ever read in my life. Um, and that's about it. All right. Well, thank you very okay. much. It was a pleasure. Thank you for to inviting you. me. It's very nice. Yeah, we will. Uh, I hope be... that people pay more attention to the Jewish Historical Society. It's. Something. I think we're we are quite successful. Yeah. I think we have more members than they do at the Stanford Historical Society. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for having me. We are now going to continue on part two, and we're going to talk to Bobby Klein. Again, it's the 5th of April, 2016, and we're at the JCC. I say good morning. It's not, not afternoon yet. Good morning, Bobby. Good morning, Lester. What is your full legal name. What well, do people call you? They call me Bobby, but my legal name was Barbara Diane. It was Shavelson, and now it's Klein. I'm giving you four names. <laughs> when were you born? I was born November 24th, 1936, okay. in Stanford, Connecticut, in the Stanford Hospital. Do you remember who your doctor was? His name was Dr. Dr. Bapkis. I remember that I don't know if I, I don't know how famous he was, and that was my mother's doctor, Dr. Bapkis. Uh, were your parents Stanford people, or did they immigrate to Stanford? I think my mother came, or my father really came from New York, but my mother was, I don't know where she was, must have been born in New York too, I don't know, they came to Stanford. Mm. And my mother met my father, some friend of hers fixed them up together, and he came from New York. Do you have any idea what brought them to Stanford? I don't know what brought my grandfather to Stanford. I, I had a brother here, Shmiel, who owned a Puritan tailor store, a tailor shop was his brother Shmiel, mm -hmm. and he came to Stanford. I don't know, I don't mm -hmm. really know. We called him Uncle Shmiel. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how about your parents? Were, were they both born in Stanford? Or? My, my mother was. I don't know if they either were they were born in Stanford. They were born in New York, America. Mm -hmm. They were not far from far from country. Yeah. Yeah, what did they do for a living? My parents? Yeah. My father was in the family, uh, first he owned a gas station called CMR Service Station, and then he went, it was attached to the Sanford Dress Beef, and then he worked in the Sanford Dress Beef, which was owned by my grandfather, Isaac Goldberg. Mm -hmm. And where did you uh, live as a child? I lived at 34 Strawberry Hill, which is now the Hayes House. But it was known as Shavelson's Jewish Center because it was right across from the high school. And everybody came out of high school. They come. My mother was a wonderful baker. They would come right to my mother, and she'd always have some kind of cookies or cake and milk for everybody. Ask anybody in town our age. That's where they went. And so that's where I grew up on Shavelson's Jewish Center. <laughs> so did your uh, mother was a homemaker? Or homemaker, but she helped. Uh, did the books help my grandparents with uh, making out checks and doing things like that, but she didn't work uh, uh -huh. physically anywhere. Were your parents involved in any political? Uh, my father was a member of the B'nai B'rith as a kid. I remember he'd have, they'd have B'nai B'rith meetings, but uh -huh. no, nothing else. Did you keep a kosher home? No, uh -huh. no, because my grandfather had a tray for meat business. Mm -hmm. So we ate only for everything. Did you have any siblings? I had a sister, Debbie, who was uh, two and a half years older than me. Mm -hmm. And uh, how was it growing up on Shorebury Hill? Were there other Jewish families? Did you have Jewish friends? It was really not a neighborhood. And, and uh, I had to walk to Center School because that was the, the district we were in. And when I walked downtown to uh, Center School, there were a lot of Jimmy Rabinowitz, uh, my cousin Yale Brazel, Bernie Shaw. They all went to. Uh, grade school there. That's where I met them. But Strawberry Hill was, you really didn't have friends to play with. It was right on a busy street. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So did you celebrate the Jewish holidays? Yes, oh. all the holidays. My mother always had every everybody came. She loved to cook and mm -hmm. entertain and had everybody. Were, uh, you went to center school. How many grades was that? Uh, kindergarten through uh, through six, but they closed up when I was going into. Uh, sixth grade, they closed center school, and I went to Belltown School, which was very different. It was almost elite up there. I can remember going to Belltown School. I had a girlfriend. There were three snowsuits. I did. Who had three, three snowsuits? And when I went to center school, it was a big mixed bag. They were rich and poor there, mm -hmm. and nobody had three snowsuits until I went to Belltown School. Did you have to walk? Uh, I got on the city bus at the uh, Knollwood. Because uh -huh. uh, it was too far, and we had to come home for lunch, though, because and that was a long run, because we, and we'd come home for lunch from Belltown School, or I'd bring lunch, and it was a big experience because when I went to center school, I was lucky I would get out of school, walk to my grandma's grocery store, and every day I would make her all open my fresh bottle of hummus mayonnaise because I liked my grandmother was for me whatever I wanted I could have so I would walk down there for lunch mm -hmm. every day my mother would be helping in the store and then I go back to school yeah yeah so how long was your lunch time if you had to go home and back to school bell time must have been an hour but it was hard to get home that's why I ended up bringing lunch in a lunch box but center school I would walk right to uh, mm -hmm. my grandma's close to it was close to Pacific Street yeah center school so uh, did you have a Jewish education did you go to an Hebrew school I went to Hebrew school with Barbara Sackman maybe we went for three months and we both stopped I think but I went I was old a little bit I thought it was the thing to do and I went maybe it was in like the fifth grade or something like we stopped so at that time, I don't think that the girls, young no. girls were not puppets. No, or, none you know. of my friends were. Uh -huh. Most of my friends went to Temple Bethel, though. I went to the shul because of my father. Mm -hmm. My mother, her religion was in her heart. She never went. My father always went to shul. Uh -huh. So, but most of my friends were at Bethel, and I was in the choir there, and everything there, and I didn't belong there. You know, we just, it was yeah. a social thing, yeah. Well, it's still pretty much the same. Yeah. Things I, haven't changed that I much. Think, yeah. 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 So, uh, after uh, center school, where did you go? Burdick. Burdick? Yeah. Uh, and that was through what grades? Uh, till the, through ninth. Uh -huh. And then we went to Stanford High School. Where, where did we all went to high school? It was one high school. At uh, Burdick School, did you uh, find that you were integrating or did you have anti semitism I, I met all my good friends there. My friend Vivian, I met her in seventh grade. Judy, Margie, they were my friends. Uh -huh. Two of them passed away. But they were my friends for the rest yeah. of my high school. Uh, not too much, but a little bit in elementary school was Dirty Jew or Throw yeah. Pennies Out for the Jews. And my biggest experience, I'll jump up when I was a young teacher, a kid came in, he says, let's throw pennies down for the Jews. I said, well, your teacher's Jewish. How many are you going to throw me? And that was the end of him. I had to put out of my class. I didn't want him in my class. Yeah. The voice, <laughs> I remember his name, too. Yeah, he was put out of I said, I don't want him in my class. And then you went to Stanford High. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm jumping from when I was a teacher, it came to my mind. But I went to Stanford High where I met Morty, and, but we didn't go to the same college. I went to University of Michigan, and then I transferred to Boston University to be closer to Morty, because he was at UConn. Uh, That's what I did. Uh, in the high school, did you have any teacher that really made a great impression on you, was memorable, or is there anyone in your whole life? No, I liked them all. I was in the, a lot of them were tough teachers, but I, I can't say mm. I have anybody who I really. Did you find being Jewish was a help at any time? It was fine, nice, because we had a whole group. We were looking, when we were doing the reunion, Morty and I, we counted up how many Jews, and it was about maybe under 40 Jewish kids. We were all friendly. Mm -hmm. There weren't a lot of Jews in Stanford High School. It was it was different. We're all friends, as you know. That's. Uh, tell us about uh, your grandfather's uh, property, and you mentioned before that the uh, Roxbury Road. He had a farm. When my grandfather came to Stanford, he could hardly write his name. My grandmother could hardly write her name, but they knew one thing: to buy property, and they owned a lot of property in Stanford. And uh, 
when they bought the house in Strawberry Hill, we lived under my grandparents because my grandmother was upstairs. When I'd have a date with Morty, she'd be at the window to make sure it was home. <laughs> That's how I grew up with her. But they owned a lot of, uh, he, because he liked to slaughter his animals and then the farm, he liked farm property. So we had a lot on Roxbury Road. He owned a lot of the land in back of the uh, Gota Shalom Cemetery. And he had a slaughterhouse there. Mm -hmm. And he would, uh, you know, when they could, that was year way back when I remember a little girl. He would take me to the farm, and every week, and we lived on Strawberry. We'd bring a baby, a little goat, or a little sheep, or a little horse. He'd bring him to, for me to play with in the backyard, and then he'd bring him back to the farm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so did he own the property where the cemetery is? I don't think so. It was in back of the cemetery. Well, no. I, I, I'm not sure, but it's it went way back, and now it's probably all. Housing development. Yeah. So then they bought land on uh, off of High Ridge Road and uh, Cousins Road. Cousins Road, Hannah's Road. Uh, all those streets are named after the cousins. Is all the cousins. Hannah's named after my grandmother. Annie Place was named after my grandmother. Downtown, a lot of property they own. So that's. Uh, that was a good investment. Yeah, it was well done. You know. Yeah. So. Uh, what uh, did you think of what you've seen, the changes in Stanford? I always say if my parents were alive, they would not believe what's going on. Mm -hmm. You know, because of Craig, we grew up in Stanford. It was, I said to Morty, when I lived on Strawberry Hill, there was a, a guy who came with a salami truck. Then the guy came, the Iceman would come. With, I can remember all these things coming right from my house in Strawberry Hill. And we go after the salami man is here. I, Crazy things. Yeah. Yeah, it was a different. Then uh, went through the uh, the war with the air raid wardens and everything else. Uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's very different. I watched them build, cut through Hoyt Street. I watched them build St. Joseph's Hospital because my mother always had a a, a woman in us taking care of us because she went to the grocery store. To tell my grandmother, and we would walk up the street and watch them building St. Joseph's Hospital. In fact, there was almost kidnapped once on Hoyt Street. Mrs. Grapsky, what it, Grapsky was that? Yeah, yeah. She saw a man pulled over, and he came out of the car to get me. <laughs> she came over with an umbrella. She hit him, and she said, "Come home, to come home with me to your grandmother." And she took me back to Strawberry Hill. Yeah, so I was, I was, was it was that was the Zelda, Zelda's Eastwood's grandmother. Yes, and she, she's the one who uh, saw this guy still pulling over his car, and she pulled me over. Yeah. I remember, it's the eldest grandmother, yeah. <laughs>
because the cow lives so long that the meat is not good tasting or good eating. So they um, ended up in chopped meat, which in that use it's delicious and it's lean and it's nice, but not for steaks or slow or uh, cooking for your family. So that development up there became popular long after he was um, out of the business. And just by accident, Stanford grew so much in the 80s that um, it became valuable land for housing development mm -hmm. up that way. And there's a lot of our friends uh, well, Dana, live up there. And it was all named after her family, cousins. But we're how many cousins? Oh, Five, yeah. six? Yeah, Alice, Jimmy, and, and so Jimmy. it was named after them. And Annie, of course, was her grandmother who was very, very bright. And she knew. At one point they owned land which I found out fairly recently, from the Hoyt Bedford to Bull's Head. That's how much space they took. And uh, then lost it all during the Depression. People, they just couldn't pay the mortgages and stuff, and so people lost everything. And... Um, but Pacific Street, you owned a lot of land, a lot of places on Pacific Street. Right. So, <laughs> but they came from the old school where if you saw a, a nice piece of land, you bought it and you held on to it and you never sold it. Mm -hmm. right? And that's the way people made money in those days. Yeah. And, yeah. and today too. So we've seen a lot of progress in the time that we were growing up and became adults and now senior citizens. What inventions do you think made the greatest difference in your life? I was thinking about that question and of course the, the car was here when I was born. But there was no air conditioning. No. What else was there? Not enough. Television. The power windows, you went like this. Right. How about the Right, how about the power steering? Right. I took my driver's license on Debbie's convertible and you couldn't, couldn't turn the wheel park. to park the dark car. They didn't so have I've seen those stuff. things, but, yeah. but I think in my mind there's no doubt that the cell phone, besides television, the effect of television, of being able to look at things in faraway places that you're never going to go to, that was wonderful. It was a major invention. <clears throat> but to me, thinking back now, um, there is no invention that comes close to having the impact on the world today like the cell phone, where you have people. Bobby and I were going, we travel a lot, so we were going down the Suez Canal and just past Cairo and we heard on our ship that there's been some kind of a disruption in Cairo and that was Arab Spring and that could only happen if you're able to pick up the phone and say hey Lester meet us tonight at six o'clock at Cairo Square we're gonna have a demonstration and that gets multiplied by use and thousands of people show up just because of the cell phone. Same thing happened in Cyprus, the same thing happened in various places. But it's that invention that lets me talk to you, no matter where in the world you are, and to other people in, in whatever your motive, devious or for good, I think there's no, nothing impacts the world the way the cell phone has. What do you think, Bobby? The cell phone, I think, I think Morty's really, his life is a computer. He like, in our house, where's Morty? He's at the computer. <laughs> if we weren't going, he'll go out, get dressed. I gotta wait, I'm still at the computer. I think he likes the phone, but living with my husband, the computer has really made it that, that, that is life. I can see, 
I'm retired uh, 12 years from school and 12 years. I go in, I say, where's the blackboard? Now in the schools are different, the Promethean board and the whiteboard, the kids don't know what a blackboard right. is. They, I don't know, and I don't know how to run the Promethean board because I'm working there because the teachers are going out for training to learn how to work it. And it's so different in school has changed because I substitute a lot of school is well, part of the reason she re part of the excuse me. Part of the reason she retired was she got, her fingers would get cracks in them get the from the chalk. Right. Oh. And okay. all these she taught over 30 years. <laughs> and she used right on the board and she would breathe in that chalk. So I think that's a wonderful invention, yeah. this Promethean board oh, yeah. where everything is on there. Lesson plans are all up. Yeah. And the kids know how to run the thing. If she doesn't know how to run it, she's six thinking. years old. Don't worry, Miss Kind. I'll do it. They go right up and do it. It's amazing what they learn and get. So you never told us where were you teaching for thirty years? I taught at Springdale School in 1957 for three years. Then I had my children, and I went back. I had a lot of miscarriages between the two kids, so I was substituting a lot. And finally, in um, <clears throat> 1974. A teacher passed away and I went back into a sixth grade and I was a nervous wreck. Sixth grade was in elementary school then. And my son Eric was in middle school. I said, Eric, you've got to help me with the math because I haven't taught sixth grade. I taught second grade as a young teacher. And I went back in 75. Which school were you at? Then? I went back to Davenport Ridge. I was at Springdale when I was young. Mm -hmm. And my girl said, Springdale, who goes to Springdale? The rolling mills are there. We never went to Springdale. Then I ended up moving there because it was a nice community. So then I went back in 74, and at the end I decided I'm going to maybe go back to work. My younger son was there in the third grade. So I went back into a fourth grade. I stayed in fourth grade for 28 years. And I left in 2003. And I said, I'm going to substitute. I'm bored. So it was okay one day. It ended up sometimes I work a whole week. But a different, I don't take a long term job, you know, single days. So it's fun. I like it. Well, you have four grandchildren. What advice would you give your grandchildren for this newer generation? So far, they're all doing pretty well. I don't know. We have the three girls and one boy. Mm -hmm. I think the, the best advice that you could give any child growing up is to give them advice about how they grew up and remind them of the education that they got. And that I think on a grand scale, if everybody in the world was educated to the fullest extent, or at least through high school, minimum, that you would end up with no wars. You would end up with equality for everybody. Um, to think that, that women can't even go to school in some countries is heinous. It's just a terrible, terrible waste of uh, a mind. So to teach your kids and to have them teach their kids that there's nothing in the world as good as an education. And I don't mean a religious education, although that's good, but uh, to teach your grandchildren to appreciate the fact that they're able to go to a great school in a great school system and to go on to private colleges and learn what you can um, regardless of whether you follow that profession or not or, or follow a profession or something that you learned in college but just to have that education in your mind and in your background will help you for the next who knows how long people are going to live soon, but um, certainly close to 100 years. Mm -hmm. And that's something that will help you for the next 80 years when you graduate when you're 20. I think that's the best thing you can teach them, to get an education and okay. teach their children. My last question is, we all grew up in Stanford. Yeah. We've seen some dramatic changes. Do you feel that the good old days were better? Or do you think we have gone in the right direction? I think it was, when we were younger, we had no problem. We didn't worry about locking our house. We could run around. There was no problems. Like today, you know, I lock my car in my driveway because they'll come in and open the door. I mean, uh, growing up, we were sort of had fun. We, uh, I don't remember it being like it is But now. overall, 
Do you well, think it's good for Stanford to have become the city yes. of 130? You need a lot more. I like it because when we grew up, it wasn't a grocery store, it wasn't a department. I'm a big shopper. I remember Robins. I'd sit over at my Dr. Solo's office. The dentist, you were right underneath, remember? Ooh. And it was a... <laughs> It was a small kind of a town. I liked it, but there's a lot more, a lot of, a lot of more things, to, a lot more things to do here. Now. I don't, I don't think that you can stop progress. No, you can't. Progress no. will come. You s people say, "Wow, look at Greenwich. They don't pay the taxes yeah, that we yeah. pay." Or look at this city, or look at that city. I say I'm proud to live in yeah. Stanford. I don't like paying taxes, but they're necessity. You have to pay taxes. If you, if you don't have a police force, who are you going to yell for if you get a problem? And certainly along with the growth of a city, you get many divergent cultures meeting together. And it's difficult for people who don't have the means. It's, it's, it's a crime to be poor in this city because there doesn't seem to be a way for you to get out of that, the clutch of growing up poor, living poor, and the way you're presented with things on television, you know, everybody needs a Lincoln or a Cadillac or a Nissan that's got every single imaginable extra gadget in it. And hundred dollar sneakers, every kid has right. to have that. So, the poorest kids have to have that. So the fact that those things are poured at you, now even through your private cell phone you're getting ads to buy yeah. stuff, that's tough, tough. And it's tough because they haven't, besides being poor, people haven't got the education to know that on the long term it's difficult without an education to get a decent job and to to care about other things, just the, not just what you want, but how to treat other people. That's all part of education, which I think is the most important thing. But I'm in favor of getting bigger and better, and um, I think Stanford is, it's tough to live here if you haven't got money. And uh, if you have to get out, that's a shame to leave, but that's what's happening to Stanford too. So. Um, it's a blessing and it's a non-blessing also. But in general, I think it's best. We're going to have the biggest, best hospital in the city of Stanford yeah. shortly. And so that's certainly a good thing. But what does that mean? It's like the Stanford school system that takes care of kids who have problems. So what, that's great that we have that. But meanwhile, it attracts more kids with problems. So what do you do about this? Well, you have to take care of these kids, and so you have to pay more taxes. So it's, it's a double-edged sword. Like everything is, there are good things and bad things, but I have the best thing right here. Uh -huh. Oh, well, that's a good ending to our interview. Good. She's so in love with like me. Like the so movie they cool. made of Stanford, I'm in it. That's well, we nice. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having us. It's been a great interview. It's been a good interview. A fabulous uh, lady taking care of the yeah, we camera. Were, you didn't know her grandfather, Joe Gruber, right? It was Joe. But my parents' best friends were Sam Gruber. Sam Gruber. I grew up in You want to tell stories about Pacific Street? You didn't tell any of your special well, stories. Pacific Street. Uh, Pacific Street. Yeah. My grandfather and my uncle had the second hand furniture store. Where? on the end of Pacific Street, just before the chicken market, on Canal Street. Okay. Cross Street from Chicago. Did you know there was a blacksmith? Yeah, in Burns. Back. Right. In the back. Yeah. yeah, I used to go there to get horseshoes to play. <laughs> yeah. But it became a radiator shop. Yeah, well, that was Schneider's. Right. Oh, Schneider's that's... grandson lives in my complex. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. moved in about a year ago. No, and no. you know, you mentioned about Gratsky. Gratsky. <laughs> well, Zelda's father, mm -hmm. Miller, yeah, Miller, her grandmother and my grandfather, my paternal grandfather, yeah. are brother and sister. Oh, God. So she's really like a second cousin, but oh, maybe God. never. We've got lots to talk about.